on this edition of Expose, American soldiers facing enemies seldom mentioned, combat stress, depression, even suicide. We send them to war, but are they fit to fight? Funding for Expose has been provided by The Hartford Current is the paper of record in Hartford, Connecticut. We are the oldest continuously published newspaper in the country. We began publishing in 1764. We published the Declaration of Independence and we're still at it today. The Current has a daily circulation of under 200,000. It reports on local news, town politics, public schools, but it also has an investigative team. Lisa Chedical and Matthew Kaufman. Matt is very methodical, orderly. I am impatient. Yes. Oh, okay. A little impetuous. No, I'm a little... Uh, high strong, is that the original High picture? strong, a little hot head, you know, a little more hot headed. Together they spent nearly a year examining three key areas of mental health in the military. Pre-screening whether soldiers are carefully assessed for mental illness before deployment. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Retention, whether soldiers with mental illnesses nonetheless remain deployed. And what Lisa Chetical calls recycling, whether combat veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder or other mental illnesses are being recycled back into battle. What the team found shocked them. The story started with a hunch. We know that they're lowering the education standards and lowering the, the weight and fitness standards, making allowances for minor criminal records and the like. If there is that much of a pressure on them to maintain the troop strength over there, we at least thought it's not a great leap to wonder, are they sending troops over there with mental illnesses who really shouldn't be over there, both for their own safety, for the safety of, of their fellow soldiers. In 2003, Army statistics showed a spike in service member suicides. In Iraq alone that year, there were 25. In response, the military sent a team of mental health experts into Iraq to evaluate its own mental health efforts. In 2004, the number of suicides tumbled to 12, and top Army officials trumpeted the drop to show they were improving mental health care for soldiers. This suggested to the reporters that the military was using the suicide numbers as a mental health care standard of measurement. Those numbers would therefore become a critical component in the current's investigation. The current team began with pre-screening and asked a question about a question on the military's pre-deployment health assessment. Question number seven. It's the only mental health question a recruit has to answer before deploying. During the past year, have you sought counseling or care for your mental health? The journalists wanted to know, was question seven successfully identifying troops who needed help? As luck would have it, there's a place in Virginia that gets every one of these forms and enters it into a giant database. It's available to the military and contractors to the military, and then it also says others with a need to evaluate the health of soldiers. And I thought, well, I have a need to <laughs> evaluate the health of soldiers. Kaufman received data from nearly one million questionnaires. Then he crunched the numbers. First, he determined how many service people in general see a mental health professional before shipping out. This is simply a chart of who was referred for a mental health evaluation and who was not. And it's kind of hard to see, but the little chart here are those who did get a referral for a mental health evaluation from a professional before they were deployed. And then the longer bar here, that kind of keeps on going, were those who didn't get a referral. And what about those who specifically answered yes to question seven? If you did say yes to question seven, 
how often did you get a referral or not get a referral? The answer Kaufman found was that only 6.5% of those who answered yes, they had sought counseling or mental health care in the past year, were referred to a mental health specialist before deploying. More than 9 out of 10 times, nothing happened. But the issue wasn't just about those who checked a box. It was also about troop retention. Some soldiers were sent into combat and kept there even when the military knew they were suffering from depression. The Current interviewed Thomas Young. I called my recruiter on September 13, 2001. I'll ask that may not be the exact date, but whenever I saw the president standing on top of the rubble with the bullhorn saying that we were going to go smoke the evildoers out of the cave, I joined the military to exact retribution for the country on 9-11. I wanted to go take care of the people that had done this to us. Once I found out that we were not going to be going to Afghanistan, but instead Iraq, I became despondent. I went more inside myself and became, for lack of a better word, depressed. And so I went and had an appointment with the chaplain, and I told him about the things that I was feeling and how Iraq didn't have anything to do with that and that I thought it was wrong. And, uh, and I'll always remember this until the day I die. He said that I would feel better once I got over to the desert and started killing people. Young says he also went to see his battalion physician's assistant, who offered him a diagnosis and a treatment. The physician's assistant, who was not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, diagnosed me with clinical depression and prescribed me Prozac. Young took the Prozac. He says it didn't help and that he went back to the physician's assistant, who talked to him for about 10 minutes and raise the dosage. Young says he never saw him again. Patients starting an antidepressant definitely need to be monitored. These drugs affect different people very differently. Dr. Arthur Blank provided medical context to the investigation. A field psychiatrist in Vietnam, he's the former director of the Department of Veterans Affairs Counseling Centers. People need to work with a psychiatrist over time, frequently for a few months, in order to find the right one and the right dose. Thomas Young soon left for Iraq, still suffering from depression. Once in the field, Young says he had access only to a low-level soldier serving as a medic, who told him they were unable to refill his prescription. They didn't have Prozac. Can't do even you know, Stories like Young's inspired Chetical and Kaufman to obtain records on medications from the Defense Department and the Army. These records indicated that the use of psychiatric drugs in Iraq had increased steadily since 2004. The reporters also came across testimony about mental health by Assistant Secretary of Defense William Winkenwerder, Jr. He said as part of that testimony that anybody with an unremitting mental health problem was not being deployed and that there were instances where soldiers were allowed to deploy on maintenance medication, but only if their condition had been fully resolved. As far as I know, there was, my situation was not resolved before they sent me over. Unless they just rubber stamped the fact that I was cured, that nobody actually told me, and I don't know if there's anybody that can truly ever tell you, okay, you're not depressed anymore. Like, it's a magic trick, poof, you're okay. It seems like the military on a number of levels are, is, is offering quick fixes. They want to stop the problem at least temporarily, but they're not looking at the long-term ramifications. Paul Rykoff founded Iraq and Afghanistan right. Veterans of America, which lobbies for adequate training, equipment, and health care for soldiers. He spoke to The Current about sending soldiers into combat, even if they're suffering mental health problems. If you medicate a soldier without follow-up treatment, you hand him a bottle of pills and say, okay, get back on the truck and go, you're really not taking care of that soldier. You're putting a Band-Aid solution on what could be a much deeper problem. Rykoff is also a vet. In 2003 and 4, he served in Iraq as a first lieutenant and infantry platoon leader. We were kind of like beat cops in the worst neighborhood in the world. We walked every day down alleyways and down streets and behind houses, never knowing where the enemy was, what the enemy looked like. We couldn't tell the difference between the bad guys and the good guys. And just spend this entire period of time in Iraq being on edge, being ready, being hypervigilant. Upon returning home, Rykoff notes, vets receive another questionnaire. 
This one contains seven questions directly related to mental health. Did you see a dead body? Every one of my guys saw a dead body. You know, did you ever get shot at? Every one of my guys got shot at. Did you ever feel depressed? All my guys felt depressed. My commander said, well, you know, flag anybody you think is a problem. And I said, well, they've all probably got some kind of problem. Kaufman and Chetical knew one of the military's barometers for the effectiveness of its mental health services was the number of suicides. They wondered what the 2005 number was, but the Army hadn't released it yet. They decided to determine the 2005 number for Iraq themselves. All they had to work from was a list of names containing approximately 130 non-hostile deaths in Iraq in 2005 and no specific information on which were suicides. Kaufman learned that for each such death, the military does an internal investigation. The result is a lengthy document called a CID report. He knew if he could get his hands on enough of these reports, he might be able to verify which deaths were suicides. We request these documents you know, under the Freedom of Information Act, and the initial response that we got back um, was that they're short-staffed and they've got um, a whole boatload of requests ahead of yours and we'll take yours in order, uh, but right now we have an eight-month backlog. I wrote kind of a pointed letter back saying the timetable that you suggest for responding to our request would not be in compliance with the mandates of Congress. As Kaufman waited for data, Chetical looked for personal stories, calling families to ask a most delicate question. What were the circumstances of their loved one's death? There's a moment you don't want to pick up the phone and you have to kind of brace yourself and say to yourself, this is for a greater good. Lisa is just the most tenacious reporter. She just doesn't give up when she pursues a story. She also has a terrific ability to get people to talk to her, to get people to open up. We wanted to burrow in and find human consequences. At the end of this policy, here is a person that was affected by it. Chetical worked the phones. Meanwhile, after two Freedom of Information Act requests, seven letters, and nine phone calls, Kaufman finally made some headway getting the CID reports when he narrowed his request to the 26 most likely to show self-inflicted deaths. It's part of what's often a lengthy negotiation of kind of cajoling and flattering and threatening. Four months after Kaufman's initial request, 26 CID reports finally arrived, and they were full of telling anecdotes, some about military suicides. A soldier who was known to be upset about things would go into the latrine with his rifle for 45 minutes. Their staff sergeant would sort of talk to them for 20 minutes, and, and they would say, no, no, Sarge, it's nothing like that. I'm fine. Um, and that's kind of as far as it would go. The CID reports gave a variety of reasons for the suicides, domestic conflicts, girlfriend troubles, financial problems. Not a single one identified combat stress as a contributing factor. Lisa Chetical, meanwhile, was hearing heartbreaking stories. The floodgates eventually opened and sort of got case after case after case that, that dramatized uh, the failures of, of these mental health policies. She found Jason Sedatel, a 21-year-old who returned home from Iraq in March 2005. He emailed Chetical, telling her how he was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, placed on Prozac and Ambien, and sent back to Iraq. He wrote that he spent another year suffering nightmares and depression. Jason Sherman was also depressed in Iraq, his mother told The Current. She says he wrote, Mom, they think that I'm making this up and that there was nothing wrong with me, that I needed to just be a man, be a soldier, and quit wasting the Army's time. Sherman was threatened with court-martial, relieved of his gun, then given his gun back. He used the weapon three weeks later to end his life. Marine PFC Robert Allen Guy, 26, was given Zoloft to relieve the depression he developed in Iraq. Chetical learned there was no record of how many pills he was given. One month later, Bobby Guy locked himself in a portable toilet and shot himself in the head. In all, 
Chetical and Kaufman determined there were 22 suicides in Iraq in 2005, almost double that of 2004. In some cases, these soldiers had been, as Chetical says, recycled back to war. Their suicides preceded by signs of combat-related mental illness, such as post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. PTSD is a psychological reaction to severe stresses, events that threaten one's life, such as being attacked or contact with dead bodies. Experiences like this produce a collection of symptoms consisting of trouble sleeping, nightmares, irritability, anger spells, and also a kind of physiological state of hypervigilance. It's like being a 250-pound exposed nerve. That's what I felt like. Every horn blowing, every light moving, everything that moves out of the peripheral corner of my eye, every noise, it's kind of like sensory overload. And you're used to people being out of your five feet of space. You're not used to being around crowds. It's, it's just really like taking you out of cold water and dipping you in hot. It's just really a lot to process. I have to say very clearly, it's extremely bad business for any veteran who is showing definite symptoms of stress disorder to be involuntarily sent back. The force is stressed, so what they're forced to do now is make the most out of what they've got, and that includes sending people back who may be already diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, who may be already borderline suicidal, who may have even tried to kill themselves before. Lisa Chetical found one soldier was sent to Iraq for a second combat tour, even though his superiors knew he'd shown signs of post-traumatic stress disorder and had even threatened suicide. A 25-year-old Oklahoman named Jeffrey Henthorn. His grandfather fought in World War II. His father was a Vietnam vet. He had three sons of his own. He took his own life on February 8th of 2005. Chetical took us back to Choctaw, Oklahoma, where she had gone to report Jeffrey Henthorn's story. She introduced us to his father, Warren. Good, how are you? Getting along. All right. Pretty nice place to grow up, right? It's not bad. That's Jeffrey's dog. Oh, is it? Yep. Uh... She'll pester you. Jeffrey's had his best friend next door. Yeah, his name was Casey. He ended up in the Marines and got out of the Marines, and uh, he played taps for Jeffrey. Oh, at the, at the funeral. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. Oh, this is the flag. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When do they give you this? This was at the funeral. It's beautiful. These are stuff that came back from overseas. You know, make sure it's clean and all this, and they ship it to the family. I'm yeah. saving this stuff for his boys is what I'm doing. This is Military Central. Everybody's got somebody either serving in Iraq or who has served in Iraq or who is on the way to Iraq or Afghanistan. I mean, you rarely meet a family out here that doesn't have some connection to the military. And that's the culture that the Henthorns have lived in and that Jeffrey was raised in. Well, Jeffrey was the third generation Henthorn in the service. They shipped him pretty quickly right off to Iraq and did one tour, and I think his plan was to, to get out and uh, rejoin civilian life. He would have been out in this last June, matter of fact. His deal would have ran out, but of course he didn't make it out. Yeah, this is Jeffrey's grave right here. He was buried here on the 18th of February of 05. I'll make sure that Jeffrey has a, a flag out here at all times. The way I understood him, he just flat didn't want to go back. And he was pretty emotional about it. And, and I didn't know whether to tell him not to go back. I said, you can't, I was, in my mind, I said, I can't tell him not to go back. I said, that's not the way the Army works. 
So I basically tried to encourage him to say everything would be okay. Um, having no idea what what was going on with him mentally, evidently. So if I had to do over again, knew the information, he wouldn't have gone back. Jeffrey Henthorne ended up really being the icon for the systemic failures we were writing about. We were looking at three areas, pre-deployment screening, this uh, emphasis on retaining soldiers in combat when they had mental health issues, and the recycling of soldiers with PTSD. And the more time I spent talking to the Henthorne family, the more I realized that Jeffrey really plunged through the gaps in the system, and his family was uh, just very brave to step forward and tell his story. After nearly a year of collecting intensely personal stories and never before analyzed data, what started as a hunch was about to be published as a groundbreaking investigative report. Finally, on a Sunday in May 2006, the first in a series of four days' worth of stories hit the press. Chetical and Kaufman reported on inadequacies in pre-deployment screening and failure to monitor soldiers with mental health problems. And they told stories about soldiers like Bobby Guy, who had not gotten the help they needed. The response was immediate. An important way for me to gauge the importance and the accuracy of an article is how many people within the veterans community forward it to me over email. And this Hartford Current piece was probably one of the most forwarded articles I've gotten in the last two years. Within a matter of days, policymakers in Washington were taking notice. I had heard a lot of stories like the ones that were uh, exposed in the piece, but you know, to see that it was a lot more pervasive than we thought, that was the shock. Senator Barbara Boxer of California teamed up with Senator Joe Lieberman of Connecticut to propose a bill for improving mental health services. The bill came as a result of the Hartford Current uh, detailed, I would call it an expose, about what was happening to soldiers who were being sent back onto the field without much help. The bill passed in September of 2006. It calls for, among other things, more thorough mental health assessments before deployment and guidelines for when deploying or returning soldiers should be referred for in-depth mental health evaluation. The legislation also directs the Secretary of Defense to develop mental health minimum standards for deployment and to establish treatment guidelines for those suffering from PTSD. It also requires programs to monitor deployed soldiers on psychotropic medications. Soldiers like Thomas Young. Okay. He is home from Iraq now. He had spent just five days there when he was shot and paralyzed. Ironically, he says he is getting the psychological help he needs now. The Veterans Administration confirmed his diagnosis of depression. VA doctors are monitoring him while he tries different drugs and dosages. It makes me glad that I only spent five days in Iraq, even though I came back in a wheelchair, because I don't, I don't even know if I am confident enough in myself to think if I could deal with those problems after spending a full year plus there. Warren Henthorne hopes talking about his son's suicide in The Current will help other military families talk about depression before it's too late. Is there a stigma? Yes, I guess there is. And should there be? No. If a person's mentally ill, it's, to me it's no different if they have a broken leg or a gunshot wound through the arm. If they don't start doing something with these people on these multiple tours, they're going to have ticking time bombs out here in the public. It's just a matter of time. Not everyone comes home with mental health problems, but I think the important thing to recognize is that nobody comes home unchanged. And that's not an anti-war, pro-war statement. It shouldn't be Republican or Democrat. It doesn't matter where you stand on this war. We have a moral obligation to take care of the people who serve.
for expose has been provided by